Okay, hello everyone. Uh, first off, thank you for the invitation to speak from Kay and Kim on behalf of the Korean Alliance for Health, Physical Education, Recreation and Dance. I've been asked to talk about COVID, sport and networks. Um, and in doing so, I'm going to give a little bit of insight in some of the research and some of the things that I've seen taking place in sport over the, 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 the past year or so. To give an introduction to myself, my name is, is, is Dan Parnell. I'm an associate professor at the University of Liverpool and sit within the management school at the university. I deliver on the football industry, industry's MBA and on a MSc in sport, business and management. I also teach on the LMA League Managers Association diploma and a number of different football um, qualifications delivered by stakeholders in the game. I'm also head of football research at Dundee United Football Club that sit within the Scottish Premiership and I'm Chief Exec of the Association of Sport and Directors. That is a, an international organisation that aims to support, connect and develop senior leaders within football. So within those roles, I'm engaged in a number of practice-based um, elements and industry-focused roles. At the same time, I'm involved in a lot of research too. So today's presentation, it will give uh, a bit of an examina examination and a bit of foundations around relationships and how we, we've tried to make sense of what's gone on during COVID. We're then looking a li little bit more detail at the uh, UEFA European Championships 2020 and the Tokyo 2020 Olympics. And I'll provide some reflections around some of the research findings, what we found and some personal observations around what, I, what I've seen. In order to give some foundations, I wanted to talk about this idea of the structure of sport. And um, in doing that, we talk about sport worlds. The group of people and researchers that I work with, we talk about football worlds and sport worlds. And we're inspired by the work of Howard Becker, who did this masterful piece on art worlds. And it's that when we look at sport, we view it as an eco ecosystem or a network of individuals that have a division of layer uh, of labour that contribute to making something happen. So um, in Howard Becker's work, in our work, we talk about people being involved in the process of construction, often in large numbers, working in collective action in a series of different steps and processes with a predefined but always in flux set of conve conventions, mostly but not always with a clear division of labour. So this social organisation of cultural production is not just an interest of Howard Becker and now ours, but Nick, Dross Nick Crossley drew heavily upon this when he, when he studied relational sociology. So we're going to give like an insight into that. And I want to give an insight into that at the start, just to lay the foundations of how we've approached our, our understanding of of COVID and what we think has taken place. So when COVID hit very early on, and you see from this article, I, I believe it, we published it in that first month where it affected us within England. So I'm based within England um, and I'm based within Liverpool in the Northwest of England. Um, so what we wanted to do, we were struggling with the pandemic personally and professionally as everyone else would have felt that globally. At the same time, we found it quite uh, useful and reassuring to discuss what we've seen and what we found and to write about it. So we weren't intent on trying to churn out research in the case of a pandemic, but we found a lot of energy and enthusiasm from talking and trying to make sense of what was going on. And we're working with our colleagues. And as you all know, when you collaborate with people, there's a lot of benefits from working together because you don't just talk about research, you talk about personal and professional stuff and it helps you help make sense of what was going on. So we wrote about COVID and networks and sport with a particular focus on what was going on with events um, and particularly mega events. As part of that, we, we wanted to look at, you know, now I want to give a little bit of context of what's gone on with sports. So we've seen a proliferation of new content built in multi-million pound TV broadcasting deals. Why is this important? Because sports contains a lot of money. That means there's a lot of stakeholders that want to return on that investment. There's been a lot of live broadcasters, been an increased prevalence in pay-per-view pay opportunities. A football uh, itself, that's a football is my main sport, it broadcasts in over 200 countries and it's a multi-billion pound global audience, okay? 
And there's also been new technologies that have sweeped sports to capture new audiences. And that kind of set some of the scene of what was going on as the, as I would say, the pandemic hit. When we, when we look at society, we need to recognize that it is globalized, networked and interdependent. And we've all seen this in sport and away from sport and how the pandemic and various lockdowns, travel restric restrictions have actually impact not just our sport, but our way of life. It's thrown up huge challenges. In the absence of any drug or vaccine at that time, we needed to reduce any burden on the health systems that operated within our regions and within our countries. So mass gatherings and gatherings in sport um, under the threat of the virus was potentially a, had this super spreader potential. So the 2020 Summer Olympics and the Euro 2020 Championships were two such events. But we were also conscious of what went on on the ground, those grassroots or community gatherings. These were the things that interested us at the start of lockdown through to now. So what were the responses to, to COVID? So we've seen cancelled or suspended events. We've seen social distant measures, travel restrictions, quarantines, even changes in funeral services and just to reduce crowd sizes. And we've also seen, or what should have seen, is clear communication from national and international health authorities to ensure that verified information and, and that fake news does not get out to prevent rumours and panic. Now, in all but the final point that I made, I think we've had various levels of progress and situations. Within the UK at the minute, we've got an easing of social distancing, an easing on travel restrictions and quarantine and testing. And we seem to be coming out of this situation in a positive position. However, we're very aware that there's been a, a real absence of clear decision-making at the top of our uh, government. You will have your own experiences from the countries in which you reside on the effectiveness of your uh, government's decision-making, uh, sport decision-making, and then what, that, what consequence that's had on your communities. But undoubtedly, people who watch this presentation have been personally affected by COVID and may have lost loved ones, and it's been an extremely challenging and tough time Anyone that has had COVID will have, will have experienced the challenges that it, that it presents. So when we looked at this in March 2020, we had an event ahead of us. And now the event was the Euro European Championships in 2020. Now, the fixtures were meant to celebrate the Eurozone. Now, despite this, the UK government have, were on the way to leaving the Eurozone. Uh, which you will have heard about Brexit, undoubtedly. However, the tournament was, I think it was the 16th comp competition in its 60th year. It was a, a celebration of free movement across the Eurozone, and it was meant to not only celebrate the fact that we had lots of fantastic different countries in Europe and to create travel and enterprise, it was also to reduce the financial risk on any one nation hosting a, a mega event. However, this biggest strength that it had at the start of the tournament in a pandemic became its Achilles heel and its biggest weakness. So during any pandemic, clearly there needs to be reduced travel uh, to ease the burden and reduce the risk of placing increased infections and an increased burden on local health services. So viruses and outbreaks have happened before. And we've operated our sport events during this time. So we've had inf the influenza pandemic during the Vancouver 2010 Winter Olympics and 2010 FIFA World Cup in South, South Africa. We've had the Ebola virus, the Zika virus, and all these events have been delivered successfully, despite the general public health outcomes associated with mega events. And while we view mega events as generally being a positive thing and healthy event, the reality is that we also have a couple of negative health consequences of having these events. So uh, FIFA uh, for the Brazil World Cup made the government change national 
uh, legislation to allow alcohol and Budweiser to be served within stadiums, which would be viewed as a negative health uh, change. And there's also the transmission of sexually transmitted uh, infections that always rise in the regions that events take place. So clearly, if there's a virus, any transfer of people is a real risk for any host nation. The question that challenged those decision makers was to postpone or not. Now, Euro, the Euro 2020 Championships was a networked competition, so it created a huge problem. There was much critique on the delay of the Olympic Games, and the uh, chair of the IOC, the president of the IOC, came out and said, there is no plan B. We will go ahead with the Summer Olympics in 2020. Now, clearly on reflection, we know that the, that did not take place, and that was the same approach he took this year. However, on the 13th of March in 2020, all football authorities postponed elite football. First, they postponed it until the 3rd of April, then the 30th of April, then it was indefinitely. Other events within the UK took place. So the Cheltenham Festival, a huge horse racing event that attracts over 60,000 people, took place between the 16th and 19th of March. This was after football was postponed. On the 16th, all grassroots football, community football was postponed. And then we start to see other things take place. So the Formula One Grand Prix season was postponed. The Six Nations Rugby Championship and one of the most watched historic famous sporting events in the world, the, the Horse Racing Grand National event in 2020 in Aintree was cancelled. So it, Aintree is also in Liverpool. So a massive event to, to be cancelled. And that was, the, that was the question. And the decision that faced many event organisers was to postpone or cancel. And obviously, when they make these decisions, they have a number of stakeholders to consider. Part of doing this is risk management. So we're really interested in risk management. So in McCloskey et al, these, they provided updated recommendations really quickly for dealing with COVID-19. And this guidance, endorsed by and support provided by uh, the World Health Organization, provided these general considerations that people should, should think about. So COVID-specific considerations, an action plan for COVID-19 specifically. And the decision is made to proceed with a mass uh, gathering. Measures and planners should consider um, risk communication, community engagement, and risk mitigation strategies. So we started off trying to develop tools to not just uh, manage risk, but to help inform decision-making. Um, obviously, these events had a number of costs if you cancel them or you go ahead of them. That could be both human and financial. The postponement of the euros was an estimated cost of 300 million and a revenue loss uh, to the European top five leagues at around 4.14 billion. So when you talk about the, the cost of just one football tournament and then one set of football leagues in Europe, so the top five football leagues, you could see the routine in this ecosystem, in this football world, was severely affected. Now, this was the same for grassroots sport and for other elite sports. The ecosystem had undoubtedly been affected and changed. The Euro Championships clearly did not take place in 2020. They were postponed until 2021. So we had Euro 2020 and 2021. In blue, you can see our original network and you could see how connected the different um, locations, the 12 different cities were, and how people would travel between these cities. However, Euro 2020 and 21, the actual tournament, still had a lot of transport of people. And this undoubtedly had a consequence for different people. So was the event delivered successfully? Well, that depends who you, who you are. For tournament organisers, they would have loved, and sponsors, they would have loved the 60,000, 40,000, 60,000 people in Wembley. They would have loved cities and stadiums being full again. But they would have also loved the, the, the climax on penalties and the excitement that goes with it. But what they would have also seen is the transport of fans of people, huge increases from when we'd recently been in lockdown. And with one match, so when Scotland played England 
at Wembley. I travelled down from Scotland on train on trains with Scotland fans. It was extremely busy. London was extremely busy. Glasgow was extremely busy. And one report in The Athletic said that Euro 2020 could be linked to almost 2,000 Scottish COVID cases. What we've probably seen during that point is that there was a lot less reporting around the impact of these events on COVID and more reporting around the spectacle and the magic of football. However, there's undoubtedly that's going to come at a cost to National Health Services and no doubt had an impact on people's lives. I could, we could argue that the Olympic Games was slightly more serious by the very nature that we are talking about more people and more countries being, being involved. We recently published a new paper in Managing Sport and Leisure, and it's called Redesigning the Games, the 2020 Olympic Games Playbooks and New Sport Event Mismanagement Tools. So we explored what was then the forthcoming Olympic Games in Tokyo, and the impact COVID had on risk management processes. And in doing this, we look back to some of the events that have been staged throughout the mid and late 2020 and early 21 to see what kind of emerging practices we might identify in terms of risk management and safety. So in the paper itself, we provide, we've tried to provide some emerging lessons around risk management. So when we looked at some of these events, which and here's just a selection of different events between January March 2021, um, we've had different strategies such as closed doors uh, and periods with no spectators or, or only a few spectators. So we might have a, a football ground that can host 40,000 people, but only 2,000 people have been allowed in. We've seen handball championships behind closed doors. We've seen 30% stadium capacities. Um, for the for the Super Bowl, twenty on twenty five thousand people, and for the Super Super Bowl and the sixty five thousand people stadium, we've seen the Australia Open that changed during that period, and then we've seen the Nordic World Ski Championships behind closed doors. So events have been affected in many different ways. So to provide some concluding thoughts, and I recommend picking up the paper that is, that is open access is. The financial and economic fallout from COVID-19 on professional and mass participation sport could be catastrophic, and I don't think we totally know what impact that has had yet. Making use of technology has been central to develop and protecting commercial revenue, but also the safety of people entering tournaments. The foundation of sport will be and has been tested. However, we will need to reflect on this more and what we've done, the decisions that we've made in the future before we can come to any genuine conclusions. Capitalising on the change in values, demands and taste and preferences provides an opportunity for new innovations to bring in different types of revenues. So when you're in a sports club, professional sports club, and you can't bring fans to your ground, then you need to think of different strategies to engage your fans and customers. And we're probably the state of player would describe as that is COVID mitigated rather than COVID safe. And whilst I feel a little bit safer now, we're very aware that COVID, COVID is alive and it is real. When I reflect on leaders in sport and society, I'm drawn to this picture. And the, the, the pictures of uh, during the just second, second World War, and the soldiers would carry donkeys and talk because they loved the donkeys or they wanted to rest the legs. Is because if they let a donkey wander around without any guidance, is that they're likely to kill other people and set off minds. And the moral of the story is that during difficult times, the first ones you have to keep under control is the jackasses. It's the silly people that don't understand the danger and do as they please. And I believe some of our leaders in sport and society haven't um, been guided we haven't got them under control because they are in control and they've made bad decisions for our society. And um, whilst we're at this point and this, this image is of obviously wear a mask, wash your hands, socially distance, stay safe. And at the same time, the forest fires are blazing behind them. And what I, I'm getting at here is that we need to step back from sport and we need to try and ask questions around what is important in the here and now. And ultimately, we need to do better. Sport is a reflection of society. So when we see poor leadership and poor decision making in society, we are going to see that in sport too. But we can be better. 
And we need to think about our initial response. And this is this idea by Viktor Fran- Frankl is that between stimulus and response is a space. And is, in that space is our power to choose our response. And in our response lies our growth and our freedom. I think some of our responses have not been based on freedom, but based on commercial um, revenue choices, based on financial risk. And we need to understand that in sport, that there is real questions we need to ask about how we are made up, whether it is survival or whether it's versus remaining competitive. And then we need to ask about what costs that, that presents for us. So by means of a summary, COVID is the biggest sport industry in society shock in our lifetime, undoubtedly. The fiscal re- repercussions are primarily evident in, evidence in the short and medium term, but we're unlikely to understand that until around 2030. Is COVID over? No, we're in a COVID mitigated state rather than a COVID safe space. Um, and sport leaders and all leaders need to reflect on the decision making processes and, mor- and morals. From an event perspective, I think we've seen a change in the way sport events are delivered and managed. Our decision making has changed. What we need to do once the Olympics finishes is reflect on the success and effectiveness of those games and what we can learn to ensure that we can provide safer and more enjoyable and more effective tournaments in the future for athletes, administrators, technical directors and spectators and more importantly, the local communities that bear the responsibility of hosting and welcoming people from all around the world in the future. I hope this presentation was a of some insight and useful uh, useful contribution to your day. I'm really thankful for the, the opportunity and hope uh, that if anyone has any questions, they will not hesitate to, to get in touch. And I look forward to meeting some of you in the, in the future. I wish you all um, a very healthy and safe uh, summer with your, with your friends, family and loved ones. Thank you very much for your